Thank you. My first time was with a woman named Maria Cristina. She was Italian. There we were, standing on the back of a tundra buggy. <laughs> As we watched this gigantic polar bear walk towards us. I looked over at Maria Cristina, and she had, she had tears in her eyes. And this bear lunged up on the side of the buggy, and we were within a meter of the world's largest land roving carnivore. The moment was fleeting, but I could tell would represent an inflection point in her life, something that she would never, ever forget. Manitoba's international calling card are our polar bears. Guests travel from all over the world every year, thousands of them, and come to our frozen stretch of ocean coastline to witness the largest aggregation of bears in the world. I'm passionate about sharing experiences unique to Manitoba and in Canada's north, and I'm passionate about sharing those experiences with guests from all over the world. But it turns out, though, there's something getting in the way of my passion. <laughs> you are. <laughs> so how's that for the welcome wagon from the tourism guy, right? <laughs> well, now, that, now that I've insulted you, let me dig that out a bit. Who the heck are these guests that I value so much? And where are they coming from? Guests from our province are hailing from countries all over the world, like the United Kingdom, Germany, Australia, and increasingly more and more from Asian countries. In the 1970s, the first to come up were adventure-type, expedition-type travelers on assignment from National Geographic and Smithsonian Institute, professional film crews and professional photographers. As time's gone by, though, that's evolved more and more into leisure travelers. So how this aggregation of polar bears unfolds today is a lot different than how it used to be. Decades ago, in Manitoba Conservation's Churchill Wildlife Management Area, and out at Cape Churchill in what's now Wapusk National Park, we'd often sight these huge, gnarly polar bears. And if we saw a mother and cubs, it was a unique experience. And these days, it's sort of turned on its ear. We don't see as many of those big bears anymore. In my short 10 years in the field, I can tell you the biggest bears today aren't as big as they used to be. And in case you didn't recognize me, yeah, that's me in the picture. <laughs> Inuit further north from Churchill are noticing differences in polar bear behavior and disbursement as well. Uh, from the film Inuit Knowledge and Climate Change, put together by filmmakers Dr. Ian Morrow and Zach Canuck, I've got an account here from a gentleman named Jonas E. Karpik from Pengerton on Baffin Island in Nunavut. He says, when I was growing up as a young man, there were no bears around. Today, the bear population is everywhere. You can now see bears where you never saw them before. Ian and Zach's film contains numerous similar accounts from Inuit elders all over the Arctic. And this account from Dr. Andy DeRoche out at the University of Alberta. Andy's been working with polar bears in West Hudson Bay since the early 80s. He says, in 1984, bears came off the ice near Churchill in early August, and they left in early November. In 2011, I can tell you that the bears were forced off the ice. They were forced off in early June. And they didn't get back on. The ice didn't form strong enough for them to get back on almost well into December. So what we're looking at is that ice period on Hudson Bay is getting longer. So recently in the news, you may have seen this. In 2012, we've established a new record for the smallest extent and volume of sea ice in the Arctic, a record previously set in 2007. So let's kind of look at this from a different perspective or come at it from a different angle, is there's never been recorded a smaller amount of ice in the Canadian Arctic, or the Arctic for that matter, than literally right now. So even the... Uh, the, the, it's not necessarily just the ice extent 
in Hudson Bay that we're talking about it's the ice extent everywhere in the Arctic. So how all this ice stuff affects polar bears is that the bears rely on the sea ice as a platform on which they hunt, eat, mate, and survive. And the shorter duration of time that they have on that ice, the shorter duration of time they have to eat seals and gain valuable fat reserves that they require to live off during those ice-free summer months. It's as Polar Bears International senior scientist, Dr. Stephen Amstrip shares with us, he says, as goes the sea ice, so goes the polar bear. So this is a, this is a mother bear with her koi. Koi is an acronym for cub of the year. When I captured this image during November a number of years ago, this cub would have been about 10 months old. Now, my wife and I are parents to three perfect children, and what really inspires me about these bears is how well the mothers take care of their cubs. Now, these Inuit and scientific observations are all very interesting, but let's again focus on the guests. So here we are. We're in a tundra buggy in the middle of the church life management area. We've just finished watching a couple big gnarly polar bears beat the crap out of each other in a sparring session. They're taking a rest right now, but they're going to get back at it. We can see a juvenile polar bear as it's on its way over. In the meantime, what I really get a kick out of is, you know, while we're waiting for that next interaction to occur, is presenting the ground truth and scientific information that we have and presenting that to our guests and sort of prodding along a discussion to see where it goes. Keeping in mind that our guests are coming from all over the world, from, you know, arriving with different understandings and beliefs from the left to the right, it's, it's safe to say that we moderate some pretty interesting discussions out there on the tundra. <laughs> it's always a lot of fun. At the end of the day, though, and I think what's really important at the end of the day, individually, we get the opportunity to reflect on what's been discussed and think about where we are and what we came for. Anyways, 30 year, for 30 years, Churchill's been known as the polar bear capital of the world. And increasingly, with all this ice stuff going on, polar bears are being recognized as sort of a canary in the coal mine. And Churchill's been uh, recognized for something else too. We've been recognized as one of these, the front lines of climate change. So, as I mentioned earlier, our guests experience this giddiness when they get to lock their gaze with a wild polar bear. But it's not just the tourists that this affects, it's also the researchers, the ladies and gentlemen who've spent most of their careers working with polar bears. Interestingly, though, in their research, it's usually conducted from a helicopter or really up close where the researchers are handling the bears. And it's not very often where these gentlemen, where we've got them put to work here in a Tundra Connections webcast, it's not very often that these gentlemen get to experience polar bears just being polar bears. You know, it caught me off guard the first time it happened. We were in a Tundra buggy together and we were just trundling along and these, these researchers were skulking the buggy back and forth with their SLR cameras slung around their neck, heads hanging out the window, and they're taking pictures of anything that moved. <laughs> and it wasn't really compelling photography. I know these guys could take good pictures. But here they were, and I'll share a picture with you, something that I wouldn't, really, wouldn't normally share in public, looking straight down from the buggy at the bear. This is a brutal picture. Looking straight down at the bear from the buggy. No catch light in the bear's eye. No snow on the ground. And buggy tracks everywhere. This is just awful. But here are these gentlemen and ladies, these researchers, snapping away, capturing these pictures. And I ask myself, what gives? You know, these folks spend their whole lives working with polar bears. But every autumn, when they're working with us, they're the first ones to stand up and get excited about spotting a bear dot 300 meters on the horizon. <laughs> you know, it's then that I realized how much value our experiences really hold with our guests. Here's the thing, though. This unique environment, as we're used to it, it, it really is changing. This is where you come in. This is why it's important for you 
as a stakeholder in our province to become invested in polar bears. Polar bears are a resource for us and considered so by people from all over the world, and we need to keep it that way. You know, we've got to ask ourselves, what's getting in the way of us becoming more invested in this discussion? I get it. Inuit knowledge stuff isn't necessarily headline news, but the science stuff, it's everywhere. And there's a consideration, though, I guess, that you know, maybe we hear it too much. I get that. So a gentleman named Dan Cahan at the Yale Law School runs the Cultural Cognition Project. Okay? And he, in his work, he observed that with greater scientific literacy and numeracy is associated with a greater cultural polarization. Basically, what he's saying here is that as we get smarter, we do a better job at finding information out there that already aligns with our beliefs. He goes on to theorize that we do this out of a psychological need to fit into communities of which we're already a part. That's why I'm here making this passionate plea to you. If the science argument isn't making a clear enough case for you, perhaps we need to make this discussion more personal. This is a woman named Sheila Wakluche. She's Inuit. She was born in Kujuak in northern Quebec. And growing up, her and her family would get around. The way they got around was on her, the back of her father's dog sled. Sheila's work on climate change and human rights has earned her a Nobel Peace Prize nomination. Climate change here in the Arctic is particularly rapid. The impacts and the effects of climate change challenge and threaten our very right and our ability to exist as an Indigenous people. The foundation of Inuit culture is cold, the ice, and the snow. Sheila petitioned the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, <laughs> claiming that the United States had violated Inuit human rights by failing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So if we follow the breadcrumbs, there's a very clear link between our polar bears and human rights. Interestingly, right down the road, there's this new building going up. I don't, do you guys recognize this place? <laughs> the Canadian Museum for Human Rights is still two ways, two years away from being open to the public. But in the meantime, their teams remain busy, etching out the experience that they're going to provide for their guests. Their leadership is all over the world at museum conferences, sharing what their vision for success is, and gaining valuable wisdom from leading thinkers in those communities. Now at these conferences, like literally, this is an honest to goodness story. Now at these conferences, when the Canadian Museum for, for Human Rights is leading the discussion, in the room you could literally hear a pin drop. The global museum community is invested in the success of Canada's first national museum outside of its capital, re capital region. And the reason for that is that nowhere else is there an idea museum of such size and scope that deals with a subject matter that's so universally relevant. There's going to be some artifacts at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, but they'll be there to help tell the stories. The emphasis here is on ideas and dialogue. And remember, from my experience, I know the power of piercing dialogue and the value of life-moving experiences. They create, in, they create inflection points in our lives. If we do this right, our guests leave with an emotional connection to an investment in this place. That's key. It, it turns out that there's people on the other side of the world that are better ambassadors for our province than we are, than you are. We can do better than this. You have to do better than this. And if you become as invested in this place as our valued guests from across the world, like my Italian friend Maria Cristina, your life will never be the same. Thank you.